Last night I was at a farewell dinner for a, a good friend of mine, a guy called Tony Ifflin, and he'd been with uh, Foxtel for 17 years. And I remember sitting down with him at the offices of Foxtel, which in those days, I think they had just announced the name of the company, and there were 10 people, and I wasn't working there, I'll tell you where I was. But um, Richard Brutenstein made a lovely speech, there were only 10 of us at dinner. And I knew I was coming here today, and I knew who I was talking to, and I got a little bit emotional. Because 17 years ago, when we were probably probably the same age, maybe a little older than you guys, but just sitting and thinking, I don't feel any different to what has happened. I don't feel I have any greater experience now than I did then. But actually, we started talking about the audaciousness of what we'd all done at the time and what we created. And so um, I hope that I can impart something to you. I don't know. What I thought I'd do is just tell you a little bit about how my life's evolved today and where I've sort of come from. I don't know where I'm going to. I've never really held that as a um, as a flash. So um, I grew up in a middle class family in Boston, in Sydney. I've never lived or worked in New York or Canada or any of those places. Um, I went to Riverview College in Sydney, had coaching, extra group in coaching my whole life. Um, don't remember ever being in the top 10 in any of my classes. Uh, remember struggling very much with, with maths. I never struggled too much with storytelling. Not good with English though. Um, so in those days, the HSC, 400 marks would get you into law or medicine. So I always aspired to getting into law. And the reason why is that around our table there were four boys, so very, very competitive. Uh, on a Friday night, if we didn't have fish and chips, we had KFC. He wanted to make sure he had a number of pieces, and, and it was always a uh, full on and full woods. But my mother um, came from a very working class background. Her uh, father was a milk uh, in Amber. She didn't get an education. They, they actually made her Catholic so she could go to the local convent where she went up to like year 10. But, um, she uh, became a, um, a catwalk uh, compare uh, back in the 50s, which was the big way in which the retailers worked. And it turned out she was quite gifted, had quite distinctive voice, and was able to, able to sell the dresses. And in the 70s, when TV and retail came together, David Jones thought they might go on air, and they were wondering what, who they would use to do this. And they screen tested a lot of people and someone came up with the idea of why don't we use our lead comp head. And they put her on air for the first time. It was straight down the barrel of the camera. It was very crude at. Started out with um, like, you know, like a Game Boy type uh, um, graphics. And it said another Channel 9 David Jones TV special. And the old girl came on, looked down the camera <laughs> and said, said basically this week at David Jones, Dickie's Tales are on sale and they're X. No one was ready for the response. The next day, David Jones, across the whole company, sold out of Vicky's Towers. And this girl who uh, had very little education all of a sudden was catapulted into being the face of David Jones, which she remained for 20 years. 10 years into it, David Jones worked out that they could buy airtime on Channel 10 and they could create an infomercial show. And she was given her own show. So the reason I say this is because during this period, coming home from school, the talk around our table was about not why TV shows worked, but why ads worked, <laughs> right? And especially when colour TV came in, it's like we all love watching the ads more than we love watching the TV shows, because largely they were black and white still, right? So there's a lot, a lot, a lot of talk about why someone worked on TV or why an ad particularly worked. On the other side, when Dad got home, he would be his lawyer. He'd be talking about the deals that were going on at work. So I had this strange mix of the entertainment business on one hand and the law on the other, and I was the first born in the family. And this may be a take out for you guys. Um, the first born usually toes the line, right? Whether you're told to toe the line or whether you just get this, this pressure on your shoulders. Dad had a firm, Dad was successful, it's important to have a profession when you come from nothing, right? No education on the other side. And so that's why when I was at school I aspired 
really aspired to being a lawyer. But what I loved was the talk of the ads and the talk of the media business. And so going through school, I uh, spent a lot of time around TV studios, a lot of time around people that were in networks, and a lot of time about advertising people. Um, but I did get into law. Well, actually, I didn't get into law. I got enough money, uh, enough uh, points to get into economics at Macquarie University, and I went there on the basis that I could maybe then get into law, and I didn't. So I did economics, which was an accounting major, which was seriously painful. <laughs> I did not get one. I'm not joking. I'm not handing it up. And I am known for a hyperbole. I did not get one balance sheet ever with a balance. <laughs> I failed first year statistics. And all my mates were very clever. And I always try and put on a bit of staff. And I'm sort of travelling with them. But they're like, how did you do that? Oh, I did study you know, meanwhile, really. So one of them gave me coaching and I got through stats. The part I liked was the management part in the second year. And then by the time I got to consolidations, that wasn't too hard. But it meant I didn't get into Macquarie Law. I had this following this dream I wanted to be in law. So I went and did, did it for six really long and painful years at the University of Technology after, after um, work. And I made a big, that was a good thing to do. Bad thing to do is work for your old man, especially when you don't particularly have any gift in the law. So I worked there, and um, during that period, I, I was actually going out with a girl who was in advertising, and she noticed two things about me, that I kept talking about ads and advertising and wanting to do that, yet I am wasn't yet a lawyer, and she, she noticed what a dominant uh, part my mother had in my life. So anyhow, her influence actually was a bigger one, because by the time I got to the end of all of that, I decided I, I stuck this six years in want to be a lawyer. I just didn't want to be a lawyer. I wanted to be in advertising, sell things, or go and work in a pub. So uh, luckily, I, 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 got, I didn't decide just to leave it. I practiced when I got my, my uh, certificate and practiced, and that was a bit of fun. You know, I learned a lot of commercial skills, learned how to deal with um, powerful people. Um, but unfortunately, I wasn't the brightest lawyer, so. I ended up being an insurance litigator, right? Now, insurance litigators slip claims, right? Falling over on lettuce leaves, making the, the occasional glamorous big, big mining accident where there was a lot of money. But um, I was always the life of the party, drinks, very good at entertaining the customers, the clients. And um, uh, into the second, so the first thing was the girlfriend who said, you don't want to be a lawyer, what are you doing? And, and you know, hit your mother over the head and do what you want to do in life because it's short. And the second influence in my life was this guy, Mark O'Brien, who was Kerry Packer's lawyer. And he joined the firm I was at to watch Fox. And at these drinks, I used to get on very well with him. I was known for doing voice impersonations and impressions. <laughs> I do, used to rerun my own version of Alan Jones's breakfast show. Um, they had an Apple system in those days with, I don't even think we had proper email, but we had voicemail. Right, that you could broadcast. So I do these impersonations of of Alan's uh, radio, and then broadcast the truth. So, so O'Brien one night after a few beers said, "What the f are you doing? You insurance stuff? The boring bars that you're living with? Don't even think about the future." I said, oh, "I know my future. My future's going to be that time." I, and I, at that stage, started to go and see luminaries in the advertising business who were all saying, "You're mad. Stay in law." You know, and so. Uh, the next week he came back and he said, I've been thinking about what you said. He said, there's no way you're going to convince someone that there's a, a link or a nexus between being an insurance litigator and being an account director of an ad agency, let alone a creative. So he said, I've got a solution. Come and work with me. Do media law. Because in, in life, if you know the general direction you want to go in, you don't need to know the specifics. I said, no, 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 I just I want to get out of this, I don't want to be one of you. He said, you're not going to get out. Come on, you're trying to find it. It's a lily pad for you to jump on. So I did. I joined him. Um, we did all the pack of work. And interestingly, you know, I heard Mark, one of his tips is follow what you think you'd love to do at work. I just love this stuff. I loved going out of the channel on the moment. I loved walking on the third floor. I loved it when Sanchez and you know blew up and used every second word. I love the whole <laughs> culture. <laughs> I love the aggression of it. I love that they wanted to win. 
I love that the journalists want to tell their stories, right? And I was the libel lawyer. And I did well. I did very well. Until we moved to Gilbert. <coughs> if you guys know Gilbert Voted was the emerging firm back in the, the 90s. And Danny Gilbert took me aside one day and said, we love you to death. We think you're being partner. And they earn a million dollars a year. It's a lot in 1995. It's a lot now. Um, but we can't have two libel partners. So we want you. There's a new thing. It's called online. <laughs> and I said, yeah, 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 what's online? And he said, well, we, our vision is in the future, it won't be. <laughs> but you'll be able to do this stuff because I've just done a big speech about. Um, what, was it? what were the DVD ROMs, DVD ROMs, or whatever they were in those days? And they were, you could make things morph and also. And, and I'd given a speech about how one day you could publish online, you wouldn't need to be a news corporation, and there would be that would have issues with, with libel. So he said, go and see Peter Waters and Peter Leonard, right? Who were the, the big gurus of that. And I'm telling you, we're talking often lawyers there. Beautiful people, very good lawyers, but that was another turning point. I came back to my office and just stared out of it for about an hour going, do I want to be here for the next 20 years, walking up and down, working my ass off, <laughs> right? Being billed by the hour and not really having a lot of fun. So the next day I went to a headhunter and said, I want out of law and I want intermediate. I want to work in a TV company. And it was 1995 and pay TV was setting up. The next day, and I kid you not, 24 hours later, I was in front of David Z. Rosenzweig, who was the general counsel of Century Communications from New York, Connecticut. <laughs> and they were looking for general counsel of a little company that bought all the... I mean, this is going to go for hours. I'm going to go for hours. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll put, make a long story short. They're looking for general counsel. They spent $120 million and f***ed up big time. <laughs> <laughs> they bought these satellite licenses. Yet Telstra and News Corporation have got together and they're going to roll cable over the whole country. Anyhow, they were looking for someone. I convinced them that I was a good lawyer, even though I'd done no commercial law. I was just a meat eating, I mean, raw meat eating, aggressive uh, litigator. And they hired me. Right? First day I turned up, another girl in the reception. And I said, So what are you here for? She said, oh, I'm, just, I'm the new general counsel of this company. I thought, like, What have I been hired for? Turned out they wanted me for business development. The next six months were the most amazing six months and developmental six months probably in my life. Every pay TV deal that was done, that was formative, what pay TV was done in the next six months between Richard Fredenstein, who was the young general counsel at Foxtel, just come out of Alice, and me. Nickelodeon Discovery, all the visionary stuff that set us all up. So that was fine, except these guys have made a big mistake, right? And I, after a little time, the Americans were drawn. I was my managing director, which at the time was a good time, good thing, right? All my, all my mates and all of the girls love managing director, business card, but these <laughs> second sold companies eventually it comes to a crunch and huge stress and some mega growing up because it went from just straight fun and the TV business into I was in deep shit and the only Australian director. Um, we worked our way through it and I sold the company to. Um, to Oscar, but in doing it, uh, a few bridges had been, I wouldn't say burnt, but they were red hot, white hot, with Foxtel, and I didn't get a job at Foxtel moving on. So it looked like I was going to be jobless. Um, and again, I, I'm working out by now, I'm not a bad salesman. I sold myself at that stage into um, Southern Star, which at that stage was the biggest production company. And the reason why is that one of the things we owned at East Coast was a little production company called XYZ, and XYZ had created the Lifestyle Channel, um, and the Lifestyle Genre at that stage were the top 10 rating things were Lifestyle, and somehow they figured that uh, given the business and the TV, this would be, so I was made hit of my drama. But it was too late. I, I was, I was uh, like in my 30s, to go, probably in mid 30s actually, to go from, I'd always aspired to that, right? I could think about that life story making TV shows, entertaining people, ads is like that, right? Selling an idea. But it was too late. Because all of the ideas that I had, in life 99% execution of these ideas, and I'm with the two Burjo's catchphrase guys and a couple of uh, documentary makers. So I got a call from Richard Priestley six months after I was there. He said, oh, of course, forgive me, come back and run it, now we own it. And I stuck it out for 18 months at, at 
So it's, uh, I learned a lot there, had a great time, got connected very much with the creative community of Sydney with, with not just um, game shows and all sorts of drama, but I moved back to XYZ and that was a fantastic time. Very important thing to do. Was, as painful as it was to go and resign and let down the people at Southern Star, getting back into mainstream and putting this suit back on, which I wear proudly, it's my battle dress here, you know. But we, we took that lifestyle channel and took it from just being a mismatch of shows into being a real brand in the space of two years. At the same time, music television was still big. I hired Barry Chapman in and we developed Channel V into quite a massive brand at the time, it was around 2000. Then, they, then News Corporation made a big uh, change. They, they put um, Kim Williams in as the head of Foxtel, which everyone thought was very, very lateral because the guy had done really nothing in TV. He'd been running Fox Studios, had some creative background. Um, and I got, I got on very well with Kim over the years. He was on my board, gave me a call one day. I came down to his office, and Kim, if you haven't picked up, is massively aggressive and massively into detail. Like, <laughs> so I've gone to his office with all my papers and it was chit chat, sandwiches, I thought this is interesting. Started putting the booty to a few people I would have liked a booty to. And then he says, we're going to go digital. We're going to go digital and this company will double in size. And that was something I could not comprehend. Could not comprehend how a product that seemed expensive, right, and seemed to be thwarted by regulations like the New Cycling Act could make the company bigger. Here's the thing, he didn't know either at that time. All we knew is that Sky and all of the other news corporation digital companies had used digital to do it. And somehow it changed their whole consumer product value equation. So sometimes in life also you don't turn jobs down because they're not going to offer again. So I said yes. And I went over. And at that stage, some one of my mates who had travelled, Richard Brunstein, had been living in the UK for five or six years as CEO of Sky, which I would say is an amazing company. He taught me or, or opened the doors for me to understand how it worked. And the way in which it worked is it goes back to price not being king. It goes back to value being king. And Kim made me the head of that whole digital thing. So it wasn't just the technology, it was getting innovations into TV. It was bringing in a, uh, an electronic programming guide, but more importantly, doing the research and finding out what content would connect with existing subscribers and new subscribers, and then how we would price it all. At that stage, Foxtel's pricing was basic, basic, or basic. 50 bucks, you've got everything. Consumers love choice, right? And they love control, and they love convenience. And so those three words is what we completely remodeled model Foxtel on. There was a, a deck of 20 slides that was done in PowerPoint that we raised $550 million on. And the key slide in it, as well as my tap dancing, was a slide that showed Sky's growth post-digital. And the key to it was, instead of putting it in years, we put it in age, how old Sky was and how old we were. And it just shows this massive increase. So Sky doubled the number of channels, increased their price, yet doubled their penetrations. And the reason why was this value equation. And that's exactly what we did at Foxtel. So um, from 2002 to 2004, we, we planned it. We executed it in 2004. Some amazing results. We planned for the ARPU, that's the average um, amount per, per customer, to be 60 bucks. In the first four months, it was 84 and it stayed there. It's currently 96. It's kept going up. And we doubled the number of customers we had. There were some issues at the moment that probably drive partly from cost but partly also from the new media environment. So that was fantastic. Following uh, digital, Kim made me the head of all content at Foxtel, um, which, which was great. And, and obviously that's connection with consumers and content. But probably the most challenging thing he did was make me head of all sales in 2008. And it was at the time when we had a magnificent sales director leaving. I'd never done direct sales. I mean, we all sell, right? If you don't realise you're a salesman, you better go and have a look in the mirror and introduce yourself because no matter what you do in life, whether it's selling ideas to your boss, ideas to consumers, ideas to consumers, you are a salesman. Um, so anyhow, it <coughs> put me in there, this guy I've left in the GFC here. And our sales had just seriously, not even half, they just stopped. 
The other thing you might like find the most time you get is the CFO. The CFO generally will try and stop that. It's the natural position. Because if he's got to handle his EBITDA and he can't control sales, he can control costs. So the CFO's idea in this position was to stop everything. We will cut our costs, take all advertising off air. That lasts for a weekend. Over the weekend, I skewed and skewed and skewed. And on Sunday afternoon, I said, Kim, we're coming over to your house. So I got to his house and started the big sell, looked into his eyes and started the whole, do we believe in our product? Is it a great product? What is the problem here? It's a consumer thing because of the GFC. We should double our advertising spend and like our salesmen do, right? we should go out and absolutely do the same thing. We should connect with those consumers and actually address the issue. Times are tough, things are confusing. We should offer a solution, right? Stay at home and save with Foxtel. And then we should get a mother right? It's taped in this is it? No. <laughs> But put a big offering. And you know, this is the other thing about Kim Williams and News Corporation, it's that big, bold thing. So, on Monday morning, we did exactly that. Put three drunk monkeys in. Staying home and safe was the thing. Fear was the, um, sort of the thing of the day. I suppose we traded off of that a bit. And we went from no sales in the first three months to a record year in the next nine months, which was a great first year in sales. Um, so that, that all travelled well. Um, and uh, like all marriages, they sort of start getting a little stale. It's not a marriage, it's just, it was more a, um, I wanted some stuff, you know. Uh, there were two of us that ran with Ken, the CFO, Peter Tyner, who's far brighter than me, and a really good guy, and, uh, and I. And I started getting itchy feet and looking around. I actually went to an interview at a media company. As soon as I came out of that, I realised what a great company I worked for at Foxville, so Ken and I had a heart to heart. And this, this sports job came up, which is really like weird. I am the accidental sports executive. <laughs> <laughs> you know? My kids, I was the hero because Mickey Mouse, if I rang him, would literally come and shine my shoes. <laughs> um, MTV, when you go to any concert we wanted. You know, the kids loved all that stuff, given the large amount of money that Foxville. So when all of a sudden Mickey Mouse went off and live sports on all the time, there's a really big twist. The reason I mention it is because in that period, right through that period, the central focus has always been about challenging establishment. And that's actually why I love indirectly working for News Corporation. I love characters like that. I love taking the ball right up the middle and doing something different. Why work for establishment when you can challenge establishment? Ironically, probably we're becoming establishment now. But that's certainly the spirit of News Corporation and Murdoch. Um, so, as the media landscapes evolve, um, movies have become, were the big seller in the 80s, are now ubiquitous. You can get a movie anywhere. You get a, you'll be able to get a movie soon going to an ATM. So, they're not something you can trade on. The formulations about, around the price are, but differentiation is difficult. General entertainment TV is becoming extraordinarily new because there are <coughs> 16 channels for free on freeware. And there's no doubt they've knocked us around a bit because they got their act together. You know, those five guys would never even talk to each other. But unfortunately, a threat always galvanises the opposition, doesn't it? And Foxtel was doing so well, and the government had again gifted them that spectrum. And with their massive output deals, general entertainment TV uh, on multi channels has knocked us around. So it leaves one thing sport. So the salesman has ended up actually where we need to be which is really creating differentiated sports. And that's what I've started to do over the last seven months. Fox Sports previously has been a utility, a company where we acquire rights and we point the camera and that's enough. It's not enough. It's not enough in 2012. Fox Sports has to become Australia's most aspirational sports brand in a very short period of time. We have to. We have to make sure that we're doing things that free to air are And that's why the three things we talk about now are live. It's not, worth, it's not live, it's not worth paying for. 
We have 8,600 hours of live. At Fox Sports, we do 650 live out, out, outdoor broadcasts. If it's not live, you can get it for free somewhere else. Yeah? Second thing is, no ads in live play. Now, ads are very important to us. Our advertisers are important to us, but we have to differentiate from free to air. So Fox Sports does not run ads in live play. We offer a fantastic uh, opportunity in terms of moving the affinity or affection of our customers over to our advertisers through sponsorship. But the, the, and the next thing is obviously high definition. With media moving the way it is, um, and the net the way it is, we have to make sure that we give beautiful pictures. The rest of the job at Fox Sports is to create a real affection brand or an affinity brand. There's only one other thing at Foxtel that is an affinity product and that's the IQ. I, I haven't met anyone that, whose eyes don't light up when they talk about an IQ because of what it does, what it does for a consumer experience. The second thing, and mark my words within a couple of years, will be Fox Sports. People at the moment, I would say, well, before the last seven months, they were right, that people get Fox Sports for the sport and they have to have it. We want to move that to, I love Fox Sports and that's why I've got Fox Sports. So, in the last seven months, we have really changed the way in which we do things. We spent a lot of money on the Rugby World Cup, created a standalone channel. We used media across mobile phones, all sorts of stuff. Uh, but I think most importantly, we created the best broadcast and the shows around it. Um, when Cricket Australia came to us with the big bash and said we think a domestic competition could do more, we jumped into their arms. Um, and I don't know, did anyone see the bash, what Fox Sports did with the bash? We tried um, relentlessly to innovate relentlessly to be different to free to wear, to have younger broadcasters, to have more energy. Uh, I paid Warney to wear the microphone. I was lucky that he got two, two wickets while wearing the microphone. I had Steve Crawley called me yesterday from Nile and said, was winning and said, you know, you guys weren't the first. I said, well, I'm ignorant, I didn't know that. But the difference is, when on our watch, he's the one that got the, the wicket, which then we used to get publicity. And we've done a lot of those things. The AFL is an extraordinary innovation to have those three things, live every match, uh, no ads in live play, and um, in HD. But we now have a complete channel down there that has been architected, again, within a brand prism to actually have a personality. So we've gone right down to, there are visual and audio cues in that channel. The visual cues of the flags and the buildings, the cauldrons that we all love to go to for live sports. The audio cues, when you go home and you listen to Fox, Fox footy, the audio cues, the sound of the siren, that famous AFL, you know, when that goes off, the sound of the leather when you kick the sheriff, the sound when a cauldron's full and you get a, that beautiful crowd, it's not yes, yes, go, go, it's rah! and it does, right? You'll hear those cues right through it. We've impregnated that channel, right? And through our life, there's a lot of stuff we've done in life. And the next challenge is going to be the NRL to do the same thing. So, and that's, that's sort of where we're up to. I don't know what, what's next. Fox Sports is at the moment the, you know, the absolute epicenter. I've always thought if you do the best in your current job, you never have to worry about the next job. Um, always do what you love, and if you're not loving it, you better be paid a load of money. <laughs> <laughs> and at some point, that even that will not be enough. It will not be enough. So be very careful with the choices you make because at some stage you will be being paid that load of money. If you don't love what you're doing, you'll have responsibilities and you can't walk away and you'll be one of those tortured solicitors that I don't have to do. <laughs> <laughs> Barristers are all very happy there on the stage, but the solicitors are tortured. And they always say, Patrick, can I talk about how you got out of the wall? <laughs> never ever give up. I've got that Winston Churchill. Cup. I think that goes with being a challenger, but never give up. If you have a dream, make the thing live. Don't give up. And in doing it, be courageous. There'll be a lot of people that knock you. There'll be a lot of people that will bash you down and say, you shouldn't do that. How can you get that law degree? How, how, what qualifications have you got to run sports? You know, If you want to do it, you can do it. And so they're, they're my little tips. I think I've got that. And the last one, stay young. So the, I'll start as I ended. Yes, we, remissed, we reminisced a bit around that table. 
I don't feel any older than I was. I don't feel any less energy, so I'm exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> the 